And I'd like to welcome you to this section, which is the long-term considerations risk mitigation section of the Natural Hazard Summit. Uh, I'm Chandra Franklin Womack. I am with Aaron and Franklin Engineering. I'm also on the TWIA Board of Directors. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jamie Brown Cruz, PhD professor, East Carolina University, to have a robust conversation on this topic. And her full bio is available on the TAMBIS website. And without further ado, Dr. Cruz. Try not to drop that. <laughs> okay, I had to take advantage of this because it may be my only opportunity. So I want to say thank you to the Academy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can barely see this, but uh, I think there is a oh, wrong way. There we go. Okay, that's uh, my introductory slide. Uh, I guess I didn't trust the one that was provided, so there's another one. You'll notice that I have two affiliations. Uh, I am a faculty member at East Carolina University, that's in North Carolina. Uh, and I'm also co-director of the Center for Risk-Based Community Resilience Planning which is a 14 university consortium headquartered in Fort Collins. So uh, I wanted to start out when, uh, at the very beginning this morning, we talked about how the Wind Engineering Research Center was formed. And it was formed because there was a horrific tornado in Lubbock. Well, I was at Texas Tech and worked with Keyshore and many of the familiar faces here uh, from 1996 to 2004. <coughs> and then I was <coughs> recruited to be the founding director of a research center at East Carolina University. The reason why that research center was created was Hurricane Floyd in 1999 that killed 56 people in North Carolina. So mainly flooding was the culprit, but uh, that hurricane, very similar to Matthew more recently, it moved into North Carolina and then it stalled there. A little bit like Harvey and just dumped water and that's a pretty flat area. So there was, uh, Greenville, North Carolina was not only getting its own flood water, but the entire base, basin was emptying. And so there was a <coughs> convergence of a lot of flood water in the area. Okay, um, okay, this is, I usually read off the slides, so this is gonna be a little bit challenging. Uh, okay, so this summit is about natural hazards. And so I would submit to you that natural hazards research is issue-driven research. The issue is there is hurricane, tornado, tsunami, earthquake, but it has a multitude of effects that affect society. And each of us from our particular disciplines can contribute to the conversation. And when we do integrated research, what we've contributed is a, a contribution to the whole in which none of us could have done it by ourselves. Okay, so that's the power of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, convergent research, whatever you want to call it. Is, and that's why we're here. Um, so, what is our goal? And I'm going to try to read that. Uh, our goal is tr to try to absorb the disruption caused by the event and then get back to proper societal functions in the area. And so, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about uh, 
functionality, which is a word that has really come up through, I believe, civil engineering, structural engineering, when you start talking about the functionality of a, a structure. What does it take for that structure to serve the purpose that it was intended? Well, that can also be applied to systems. Okay, it can be a hospital system, it can be a school system, it can be an individual hospital, or the entire, it can be an economic system. It can be a set of structures, or a single structure. But that functionality, then, is the ability of that system to serve its intended purpose. Okay, I'm going to repeat to you, uh, and a lot of my theme is about resilience this afternoon, after our very nice lunch, is this is from the presidential directive, and I wanted to highlight to you that within resilience, and I think this is referencing infrastructure, but the idea is that the system should be able to withstand and recover rapidly from a disruptive event. So uh, I don't know how many of you are used to looking at this. We kind of call it the swoosh. But the idea is if you have a, a system, it's operating at a certain level, and we could call it a baseline level. A disruptive event comes along. And first of all, what you do, let's see if I can get this. You have losses, right? And that's only one dimension of resilience. And by the way, I wanted to really thank the previous three speakers. I thought they kind of teed up this, this particular uh, talk. But so when we look at insured losses, uninsured losses, damage, that is one dimension of resilience. The other dimension is going to be, let's see, recovery. How long does it take for that system to get back to some level of baseline? And so we have two dimensions to resilience. And if you want, okay, and here's an example of a, a, car, a cartoon of a disruptive event that had fairly high losses, but the recovery was very quick. So how do we measure resilience? Well, if we wanted to be very careful about it, what we would do, is we would take the integral under that baseline of either of those curves to, to get some kind of a measure of resilience. Okay. I'm going to see, yeah. Is resilience a new concept? It certainly has been in the conversation a lot lately. So I'm going to give you a quote. And this is the first part of the quote. And uh, so this talks about natural hazards plus human caused hazards like war. And this is a little later on in that particular quote. Now you might be able to tell just by the way the prose is, anybody want to guess when that was quote was taken in, in the published work? OK. Oh. 1896. So I would argue, John Stuart Mill, that, that what, it, what was being described there is resilience. And so the question then becomes, is our society more or less resilient than it was 125 years ago? And I think part of the answer to that is we've created a beautiful infrastructure, a beautiful culture that maybe has made us a little less resilient because we're used to so many of the benefits of that infrastructure. Okay, we've got 
a big quote since we have lots of esteemed members of the National Academies of Science. This came from a, a, a report that was about community resilience. And what it argues is if we're going to measure community resilience, it needs to capture that dynamic nature, the temporal nature of recovery in addition to the magnitude of the losses that could occur. And uh, I mentioned that I am a co-director of the NIST Center of Excellence, and uh, this National Academy report came out about uh, four years after that Center of Excellence was created. Okay, so what's our goal? And so I hope Andrea is still in the room. <laughs> Uh, uh, with this, what we, what one of the processes, in addition to very good science, very good engineering that went into the background of this center of excellence to understand better both the, the destruction and the recovery of infrastructure, structure, and other systems, uh, we also were tasked with trying to come up with metrics of success. So what is it that a community, what are the characteristics that we're looking for to identify that would hopefully <coughs> allow us to measure community resilience? And so uh, this is a, this isn't my quote here. This is uh, from uh, the College of Management, uh, and I'm trying to remember the original author, but this is uh, often quoted as you can't manage what you don't measure. So these are the things that we would like to see as ideals of a community resilience metrics. And at the very end of the day, they need to fit the goals of the communities. Okay, so there are uh, five NIST stability areas. Uh, and for the first one, which I think is the most important one, is population. I look at population as a thermometer more than it, you would call it a system. But if you, uh, and these are core metrics. We tried, uh, there are some community metrics measures, resilience metrics. They use 150 or more measures of community. What we attempted to do was restrict the set and get to a set of measures that we could report for every community that if they felt like they needed something else, we would do our best to construct those. But if we look at this, uh, the population and household characteristics, um, if you'll notice, there are measures in there that allow us to look at equity, at wealth distribution. Well, we'll talk about wealth distribution in a minute. But uh, what are the characteristics of the population and that's going to allow us to look at population displacement. Because the one thing I would submit to you is that as we look at the other systems, if the systems aren't doing what needed to be done for the population, they will leave. They will find a better place to live. Not immediately, but uh, I think one time I said, what is the definition of uh, an area that has excellent structures, excellent infrastructure, but no people? Well, that's a ghost town. <laughs> and, and so I would argue that what we need is a population-centric approach to looking at community resilience. So these, to me, are very important measures. Okay, on the economic stability areas, these are the core metrics that we identified, uh, and if I can read them sideways, household income, 
uh, community level gross domestic product, which comes from something called a computable general equilibrium, which is part of the in-core package that we're putting together. But uh, employment, unemployment, and then importantly, uh, either a Gini coefficient or some other measure of wealth inequality. Once again, this is where we need to think about how does equity fit into this problem? And how, how can we identify ways that ensure or promote community resilience, but community resilience for all members of the population? Okay, since uh, we talked about this in an earlier uh, discussion today, very important are at least, uh, we identified two of the many social services that a community provides. And so what's very important is what's happening with the healthcare industry. And so we uh, have used staffed bed count as a measure of how resilient that system or what is happening over time with, with the hospital system. And the other part, and uh, uh, Karen talked about it, is that how important is the educational system? We need to get it, make it so the children can go to school, the parents can work. And uh, one of the terms that I've used when we talk about what do we want for a community, we want it to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Education system hospital, medical system, and a way to create a livelihood. Okay, so, oh, I think I've skipped one. Okay, now, since most of the population are most interested in the really good physics-based science behind structures, how the structures respond to different hazards, uh, our core metrics are going to include counts of functional housing units and also some measures of infrastructure functionality. And I didn't include that on this slide, but I've got it at backups if you want to look at those further. But we need to look at all of these parts to really get a handle on the community. Okay, so. One of the big products, and uh, some of you may have already seen this, is uh, within the Center of Excellence, there, uh, the impetus, certainly in the second five years, is to create this really good physics-based science and also create a platform in which, which is open source, that individuals can use. And so uh, different levels of expertise are going to allow you to use this in different ways. But the idea is that this is going to put together the whole package. It's open source. And uh, there will be in the um, Americas Conference at 1015 on Tuesday a chance to really dig into the nuts and bolts of this. So. Uh, if you are so inclined, we invite you to come and listen. Okay, that concludes what I was going to say about resilience, but I have to uh, take advantage of you because everybody wants to show just a little bit of research that has come right off of the... Uh, okay, so this has to do with... Uh, one of my colleagues, and I get to share some of the information with you, but has used Shieldus data to look at uh, major disasters in counties and uh, has looked at hospitalizations at both inpatient and emergency room visits. It seemed to me this was appropriate since we're reaching across disciplines in this. So what effect do disasters have on human health? 
We already heard about mental health. Uh, and this is very preliminary work, work but uh, if you'll notice, there is, uh, I think, three million observations on one and quite a few observations. So it's not huge data, but it's fairly big data. Okay. So what was estimated was an out the outcomes as a rate of uh, hospitalizations, and it's controlling for the county and whether or not it was a disaster area. And uh, see if I can see what else we have. Uh, okay. okay, and then controlling for some of the other variables such as unemployment. Okay, this is the first result. And if you look at this, uh, the gold stuff is it's highly significant. And so uh, what we see is post-disaster, we have an increase in cardiovascular events and in, uh, somebody read that for me, I, oh, in di diabetes. And what's the uh, far right corner? Gastro. Yeah, okay, why gastro? Hurricane, water contamination. <laughs> okay, here is what we have for emergency room visits. And so we get some slightly different, uh, I think, as I recall, cardio does, goes the opposite direction. And uh, we see instances of asthma, and then again, we have uh, the far right corner, which I can't read. But I guess the thing that I wanted to share with you on this was, okay, this is starting with the science of what is ever happening, the phenomena, the hurricane, the tornado, and is following all the way through to what is happening health-wise with people. And so this is, is like, over here we have an end result, over here we have the initiation due to the hazard and so it's our job to fill in what's in between to see if we can improve and make, make it so that uh, we aren't seeing adverse health impacts due to hazards. Okay, I think that's it. And I probably have used less time than I was supposed to. <laughs> I know it's after lunch. The last results that you showed the, the disaster or a hazard of disaster occurring and a certain type, particular type of health, what do you anticipate to fill in the gaps in between when you say? Uh, well, I think that uh, sort of one of the things is whether or not our hospitals are in a position to take care of people when they come in and to, to make those events less severe. But if we back up one more, perhaps some of the emergency response that goes with uh, a severe weather event is is going to help reduce those impacts because uh, the one slide I didn't put up is some of those are anxiety related and so things that we can do to help people prepare and uh, make it so that it's not of anxiety producing event is going to help, I am sure, but I'm not the medical expert here. That's, uh, I'm quite happy to let somebody who is more ex expert than me say, give an answer. That's, that's wonderful. Um, going back to your resiliency uh, topic, um, you know, we saw earlier we have all these new technology, uh, innovative uh, resources that are available. 
So when we're measuring that community resilience, how, who, is, who locally is tasked with gathering that data and how can we better support those officials, uh, those local people on the ground to, to gather that data to feed into this resiliency discussion and, and further that along? Yeah, that's a great question because I think most people in the room would, uh, would agree that data is the challenge. And so as we think about what is happening with STEER, the last slide had to do with the fact that they were going to, for Lake Charles, create, lo uh, create and collect longitudinal data. So I would love to see the 360 degree cameras go back. Uh, actually, uh, the NIST Center has a long-term study of Lumberton, North Carolina that's, produ that's producing data that is, has to do with the structures. It has to do with the infrastructure. There are individual interviews with households in a, a select random sample of the community. And there, are, uh, there have been interviews with the schools, the hospitals, and uh, the state level decision makers. And so more, you know, the problem is those studies are tricky and I'll have to tell you for sure that when COVID came along, they got even trickier. Uh, so we had to do some things that were, that allowed us to collect some information without creating the personal contact that was against the rules. Uh, but those, type of studies that study what's going on over a longer period of time are going to allow us to capture how recovery comes about. And that is the other dimension. I mean, I've done many, many uh, published papers in which we looked at losses. And that is, it, that is very important because if you can reduce losses, if you can mitigate losses, then the road to recovery is much smoother and hopefully what we can do is shrink things by both dimensions but data is key oh and i wanted to point out to you uh, that when we look at if you ever have a chance look at uh, something that is a slightly a, a competitor to zillow redfin if you look at redfin they have, uh, and you pull up a property, they have climate risk and flood risk. The flood risk comes from First Street. But at least someone is attempting to create information that goes with that listing that gives a sense of what are some of the, ri the hazards risks associated with that. You're, you're absolutely correct and that when you're talking about resiliency, you're talking about preventing the loss before it happens because you're, you're trying to reduce both of those factors. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the time uh, to recovery is, is critical. Um, I come from an engineering background and so I'm doing, <coughs> I'm implementing all these wonderful techniques that all these researchers have, have spent literally time, money, life, and limb to bring to the table. And so I greatly appreciate all that. But with the changes in all this emerging research on resilience, how do we incorporate those techniques, the engineering techniques, and to more of a widespread community design? And how do we influence design standards so that we get to that point where we don't have that loss? Well, that's uh, that's a big question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, maybe the, somebody else. The not one, here the one other stability area that we haven't addressed is is governance stability. Yes. And so the, the piece is, is there political will? Well, I think there are, just like we talked about with people that have to replace their roof because it's blown away is a perfect opportunity to get them to strengthen their roof. I think there are certain times that there's an opportunity to influence the political will of a community. And we're working with, uh, four communities right now to, to test initial versions of INCOR to get uh, feedback from them as to 
what they would like to see. And sort of my dream for this particular uh, platform uh, is that what I want, I want it to be that a community can look at some of the output of this product and be able to fill in a line in a hazard disaster mitigation grant. So the form will ask for and accept information that comes out of this software that communities can use to fill out their grant proposals. And if we can accomplish that, then it's going to become a whole lot more attractive for them to uh, use this. But uh, there's a considerable amount of effort that is going in to making this an engaged product that uh, communities will be able to use at the same time the professional community can use it and adjust it to their needs. Well, I'm really excited that this technology is coming now ahead of some of these disasters <laughs> and that we're going to hopefully be able to utilize it in order to do just exa exactly that thing where we can use it for the, the hazard mitigation after the fact. Right, and I, I didn't mean to make this an advertisement for Encore. <laughs> there are some other very, very good packages that are in development, but uh, hopefully there'll be a convergence in that uh, all of these will come together and contribute their own piece of, of contribution to uh, giving new tools to individuals and communities that are trying to make these decisions. Well, I'm going to open it up to anyone else that may have a question for Dr. Cruz. Oh, yes. Of course, I liked your part about measuring success criteria. I was just curious if you had any plans to go beyond community resilience and look at any of the national policies and their success rates and uh, management styles. Um. I'm open for a discussion on that. Right. <laughs> there may be an opportunity for collaboration. Yeah, well, and there's, uh, like I said, there's, there are many, uh, there are a number of these platforms that are being put together with not exactly the same intent, but uh, certainly this one, and I know you're working on HASIS, they need to be communicating so we can identify what has this does very well and what this can do to enhance what has this provides and use some of has this as data sets. Anyone else? That's fine. I think we're all just recovering from that lunch. It was wonderful. It was, and it thank was you delicious. very much for your time this afternoon. We appreciate it and uh, we appreciate your issue driven research and Wish you all the best in <laughs> continuing that. Okay, thank, thank you very much.